just before I move on to the next thing, uh, for any of you who have ever put on a uniform in your willingness to protect and defend our country, we would just like to say thank you to you this morning. So thank you. We really are grateful. Uh, there's one thing I want to do this morning before I get started with the rest of my time, and that is uh, we have a really special little guest here today. His name is Ian. And Ian is heading into a pretty significant day. He'll, he'll fly out of here today and uh, head to New York City. And there's some procedures that are absolutely essential for him. And uh, without these procedures, um, well, things would be more challenging than any of us would want. And so Ian is here with his parents, Chris and Christina. So I'm going to have them come forward this morning. And we would like to hold them up in prayer as they head into a really challenging couple of weeks. And I'm going to ask any of our prayer team, elders, staff, if you'd like to join me up here, you're more than welcome. Every one of you, I'd like you to participate in this prayer. Would you extend your hand towards Ian? And don't just listen. Let your voice be lifted to ask the God of heaven and earth to move on behalf of a precious little boy. Father, we come before you this morning and we bring a special and precious treasure not unknown to you. We need not introduce Ian to you. You know him well. You know the challenges that he has faced and the path that he has walked. And you know what Chris and Christina have had to do and had to walk through with him. We're so grateful for their devotion and strength and love that they have demonstrated in the care for their precious son, Father, we lift Ian to you right now, and we ask that this procedure would go without any complication. We ask that it would accomplish the purpose that is intended, and that there would be a long and healthy life. And there are some things that they're not expecting to be able to happen for Ian. We ask that you do something that opens opportunities that are unknown or unseen by anyone who is acting courageously for, on Ian's behalf. Father, you are the one who's in control of his life. We trust you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Last week, Jonathan actually kicked off our series uh, called The Difference. What difference does it make if you really are a person of faith? What difference does it make if you actually follow God and believe in things that he says? And last week, Jonathan talked about, gives you a set of convictions to live by. Today, I'd like to talk about confidence. We're in Daniel chapter 2. I won't read all of the chapter, but some of the verses that I think are essential to the story. So when Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone, to put, gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon. Now just listen to that phrase, to put to death the wise men of Babylon. Daniel spoke to him, what's the next three words? With wisdom and tact. How many think when someone's coming to put you to death, wisdom and tact is probably a good strategy. And he asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. 
Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You probably know them better by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. And during the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness, and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. So this is a really interesting story. The backstory is, is that the nation of Israel had lived for several hundred years as slaves in Egypt. God, through a miraculous set of events, released them out of slavery and began a journey toward the land that he promised to give them. He got them out of slavery fairly quickly, but to get bondage out of them took a lot longer. Eventually, they would possess the land that God had promised them, and they built a considerable nation. For about 200 years, things went reasonably well, but it declined to the point that eventually there was civil dispute and the nation was divided into north and south. The northern kingdom was eventually defeated by Assyria, and the southern kingdom, a few years after that, defeated by Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. He's the one responsible for the destruction of the southern kingdom, Judah. And, and Nebuchadnezzar has a unique strategy when he takes over a country, when he invades, he doesn't just extract and take from it all of the resources of value in terms of gold and silver, precious metals, implements of war, anything like that. He takes all of that, but he also takes the best and the brightest of the young adults in that community. And he takes them back to Babylon to be enculturated. They are given an education in Babylonian literature and understanding. They wear Babylonian clothing. They're supposed to eat Babylonian food. They, they, they do all things. They learn Babylonian language. Everything now has to be about Babylon. When you think about it, it's a really clever strategy because if you take away the best and the brightest influencers, who's going to rebuild the nation that you just laid siege to? And not only that, he gets to use them, the ones that are good enough, to fulfill his own purposes. And so this is the strategy that he, he uses. What's interesting in the story today is when Daniel hears that there's been an execution order issued by the king for the destruction of everyone known as a wise man in the kingdom. These are the people who would, the, the king depended on for counsel. They'd had special levels of education. All of the wise men are now being put to death. He, he wants to find out why this is so. And this is an interesting thing. The king had had a dream, and it was a bad dream. How many have ever had a bad dream? Okay, some of you think you're in one right now, don't you? And you're <laughs> trying to wake up, but it's not happening. And so, so he had a bad dream, but when he wakes up, he can't remember it. How many have ever had that happen? And so he goes to the wise men, and he said, I need you to interpret my dream. And they said, great, what's the dream? And he said, I'm not going to tell you. You tell me the dream and its interpretation. And the wise men go, no one's ever asked a question like that in all of human history. It's not reasonable. And here's the thing about unreasonable kings. They don't like to be told they're not being reasonable. And so he said, fine, if you can't do it, I don't need you. You're all dead. And they don't know what to do. When Daniel hears about this, he immediately asks to go in and see the king. And he says, give me time. I will tell you the dream. I will tell you the interpretation. Where did Daniel get that kind of confidence? Because I will tell you, our culture wants that kind of confidence. But Daniel didn't get his confidence the way others in his culture did. And if we want lasting confidence, we won't get confidence the way others in our culture does. 
See, I think a lot of us think that if we just had, and then we fill in the blank with something, if we just accomplish, and then we fill in the blank, if I could have that, do that, be that, then I would have confidence. And we all wish that that was true. Just fill in the blank. But what we discovered is that even when some of those blanks get filled in with the things that we want, the confidence isn't always available when we need it the most. And to be sure, there are people who look very confident in our culture. They've learned to put on a mask. Please understand this. God doesn't ask us to ever put on a mask. Following Jesus is not about pretending to be something you're not. See? There's a couple of reasons why we tend to lack confidence. One is we know the truth about ourselves. There are some things about us that aren't flattering. When we look in the mirror, we notice all the weak spots and the shortcomings. We have memories of things that we didn't accomplish the way we desired or even failed miserably. There, there is truth about us, and, and, and we can't escape from that reality. And so we just we look at ourselves and go, I know, what, I know where I'm weak. I know where I fail. I really can't be a confident person. But it's not just the truth we know about us that makes us uh, lack confidence. It's also the lies that we've heard that make us lack confidence. We've all had voices that have spoken into our lives and they've told us things that were not true, but for whatever reason we believe them. And by the way, some of those most condemning and destructive comments actually weren't issued by someone else. There were things that we've told ourselves, and it's really hard to tell yourself something and not believe it's true. Some of our self talk is incredibly destructive. So the popular approach in our culture is just simply strengthen where you're weak. Just get better at those things and then you have confidence. And learn to ignore the voices that don't see the truth about you. But this is what I will tell you. We try to improve where we're weak and we try to ignore the voices and then we still get beat down in our world. Our culture has a phrase for this. They say that the hell just gets beat out of them. What I want you to know, that's not what's happening. Hell's getting beat into them. Jesus tells us there is a kingdom of hell and it has a leader and he has an agenda and that agenda is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. To take away from you what is rightfully yours, either because you earned it or because it was given to you. To kill, to execute your dreams, your hopes, your ambitions, your goals, your future, just to kill all of it and to destroy. This word is fascinating because it's to smash down and tear apart, to attack the emotional and spiritual being to the point that thinking that all you can do in order to end the pain is to end yourself. We use this word when we talk about animals that we want to humanely put out of suffering. We say the animal was destroyed. And our culture gets hell beat into it, into the place that we think the only way to end the pain is to end ourselves. You are not an animal. You are a human being created in the image and likeness of God. And you have another leader in your life, and it's not the leader of the kingdom of hell. It's our Savior Christ Jesus, and he has an agenda for you. And he says it right after he discloses the agenda of the wicked one. He says, but I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. That's what God intends for us. So King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. The problem was he couldn't remember it. He demanded that people tell him what the dream was and then interpret it. And then he ordered the execution of all the wise people if they didn't do it. And this is what Daniel says in Daniel 20, uh, second chapter, the 24th verse. He said, do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king. I will interpret the dream for him. Wow. There's no way to read that without confidence. So where does he get his confidence from? Lasting confidence comes from knowing and believing that God is wise and powerful. God is wise and powerful. The, the combination is absolutely essential. If you are wise but you have no power, you can't put things into place that will actually help fix situations or benefit others. Wisdom without power is unable to hold accountable those who have acted unjustly. Wisdom without power just, just you see what could be and then you can't do anything about it. But power without wisdom, 
That just imposes an unbelievable kind of pain that's only based on preference. It doesn't matter whether it makes sense or not. It's just what someone wants. And so we don't have a God who's wise without power or powerful without wisdom. We have a God who's wise and powerful. And Daniel begins with that assumption. And Daniel's confidence is based not in his ability or his wisdom or his power, but in God's ability, God's wisdom, God's power, which raises some fair questions. If God is wise and if God is powerful, then why? Isn't that the question we usually ask? And Daniel could have asked that question too. If God is wise and God is powerful, then why did I get abducted from my family and from my homeland and from my community and from my faith? Why was I transported hundreds of miles into a place I don't like with people I don't know, with food I don't prefer to eat, and a language I don't understand? Why would God let this happen to me? Which is always what happens when we're in a place we prefer not to be. That's the question that comes forward. And it would be very easy to think this. I am here because somehow God is punishing me. Daniel did not assume he was being punished. Daniel assumed that God would use him right where he was. That God had a plan. It wasn't obvious. It wasn't clear to him. But God knew what he was doing. God was using them in a place they preferred not to be. So here's a harsh truth. Most of us will never go to places we prefer not to be. This last week, I was in a place where it was 21 degrees, and it took bulldozers every single day I was there to move the snow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> did I want to be there? I did not. There was a good reason to be there, but I'm not a big fan of cold and snow. And I know you're saying, well, then why are you living here? <laughs> and I could say, because God is punishing me. <laughs> but he's not punishing us, he's using us. If we only went the places we wanted, if we only did the things we liked, if we only did the things that felt easy, we would never be an instrument of grace inserted into the dark places of this world to bring the life and the love of God every single where it is needed. Babylon, Babylon needed God too. And there wasn't anybody starting up a missions trip to there. So actually a decade before this experience, there have been another group of young adults who have been extracted from Israel. And, and when they got to Babylon, they decided, we know God is going to get us out of here. God's going to deliver us. God's going to rescue us. God's, don't, don't unpack your bags any minute now. And the prophet Jeremiah, who was a prophet who could discern the mind of God on things and communicate it in a way that people understood, he sent a letter to those exiles in Babylon. And this is what he said in Jeremiah 29. He said, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried away into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. <laughs> God told the exiles who were there against their will, build houses to live in, plant gardens to eat from, commit to lifelong relationships right where you are, have children where you are, pray for the prosperity of the city because when the city does well, you do well. Do you know what we hear a lot of today? Pray for the judgment of God. Let God's judgment. I mean, if you were in exile in Babylon, isn't that what you would want? Let the fire fall. Let an invading army come in. Let them see what it feels like to go through what I have been through. And the prophet of God says that is no position for a follower of God to, to take. That is, there is a difference between how we think when we follow God and how others think who choose not to follow God. And, and I'm going to weigh in on some risky territory. Can I do that this morning? All right. 
That's what you say. We'll see. <laughs> there are some people who will not pray for the prosperity of our nation or our state or our city unless the person they prefer to be in an office is in that office. And they will withhold their prayers until their party is in power. And God does not say, when your party is in power, then you pray for the prosperity of the nation or the state or the city or the community. He says, you pray for it now because the person who holds an office holds an office, but God is the one who's in control. Right. Doesn't that make sense to you? I don't want to wait until the person I want is in office for prosperity to come, because they not, might not be voted in. But we can pray, because when, listen, when the city prospers, you prosper. When the city's at peace, you have peace too. So Daniel couldn't change his location, but he could bring change to his location. There's the difference. So, God is wise and powerful. Second, observation that will help build your confidence is God is generous. He shares his wisdom and power. This is what it begins to say. It says that God changes times and seasons. How many know which season is coming next to Western New York? Yeah, some of you won't say it because it's like a curse word to you. But winter is coming. Snow is going to fly. And, and we're going to have to have shovels and all that stuff. And you're in, this is what I, I need you to know. Seasons are not eternal. Granite, winter feels like an eternity around here, but it's not. Eventually, spring does break through. Please hear this. You are in a season, and God will provide in the season you are in. That there are things that you need right now. We just prayed for a precious little boy. They're in a season that they wish would be concluded, but this is what I know. God will provide every single thing that family needs in the season they are in. So he provides. He gives generously. We might not be able to control the season, but God can change the season. In the meantime, he can provide all we need in the midst of it. The king was not in control. He thought he was. He couldn't even control the dreams he was having. He couldn't control the future that was about to take place. He was not in control, and neither are we. If your confidence is in your ability to control things, you are going to be in for a very rough ride. We're not in control, but our confidence is in the one who is in control. So you are in a season God will provide, and you are heading into a season God will prepare you for it. God will begin to prepare you for what will happen in your life. I think sometimes we miss this. We'll come into a room like this on a day like this to hear a message like this, and we might walk out and say, well, it was okay. Not really anything I could apply today. I wonder if maybe God is giving us something today that we're going to need tomorrow. And we don't even know how much we're going to need that. God can use our time together. God wants to invest in you. He's generous. He wants to make you strong and wise. He wants to make you patient and loving and kind and generous and joyful and peaceful. He wants to do all of that because when he does that work in us, by his grace and by his generous heart, it begins to leak from us and make a difference in the world around us. Daniel was not confident in himself. This is what he said. No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. Confidence may seem like a small thing to you, but I'm telling you, it accomplishes the most amazing change in the world around us. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes we can be competent. We can be good at something, and God uses that too. But being good at something does not mean we're ready for anything or everything. Our confidence is in God. So put your confidence in him because he is wise and powerful because he is generous, and because he is here. Let's bow our heads this morning.